Building of the Catskill water system is a tale of heroism and heartbreak, political maneuvering, the loss of communities, brilliant engineering, and a quiet power struggle between a major city and a remote rural area. It involved thousands of stone cutters, bridge builders, railroad workers, tunnel diggers, and mule drivers. In scope and size, the building of the Ashokan Reservoir was said to rival the Panama Canal. By the time it was completed, 10,000 acres of land were claimed by the city. 2,000 people had to move their families, and over 500 homes, 35 stores, 10 churches, 11 schools, and five railroad stations were destroyed or moved to new locations. June 1st, 1905. Spring has come to the village of Brown's Station. Farmers work in the cornfields. Loggers haul wood from High Point Mountain for the local sawmills. Bluestone is cut from quarries in nearby West Hurley. And kids are swimming in the cold Asopus Creek. Within several years, this hamlet in the Asopus Valley of New York State will be gone. Farmhouses, barns, stables, town buildings, gardens will be hauled away, burned, or relocated. Even graves and bodies will be dug up and reinterred. Brown Station will be buried by water, water up to 100 feet deep, water for New York City and its millions of thirsty citizens. 120 miles to the south. For now, Brown's Station is a peaceful, almost idyllic place. Residents do not fully understand how completely their lives will be changed how they will sacrifice their homes, farms, and heritage to a city that is desperate for fresh drinking water. Nothing will remain of the original Brown Station. Brown Station was in a quiet, tree-shaded valley, protected from the tensions of the world to the south. It was a typically beautiful Catskill community, with mountain vistas that inspired the Hudson River School of Painters and the artist community in nearby Woodstock. By contrast, the city was growing fast. Manhattan had merged with Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island in 1898. New York City was hot, dirty, and overcrowded in the summer of 1905. Immigrants had been pouring into the city for years, arriving by the boatload from across Europe. Most of the new arrivals were poor, with no formal education, crammed into slums. Many people were without sufficient water for cooking, bathing, and cleaning. The heat of summer made it seem that much worse. New York's Croton Reservoir System, some 42 miles to the north, had been supplying water to the city since 1842. Although a big help at first, the original Croton system could not meet the needs of the city. New reservoirs were built in Putnam and Westchester counties, including the new Croton Dam, which was well underway at the turn of the century. But 
New Yorkers traveled upstate throughout the 1800s in search of what they called healing water. Water was in fashion, pure, cold, refreshing water. Although people in the Catskills looked upon city residents with some mistrust, they relied on the city for much of their income. Sales of bluestone, cement, lumber, and farm products kept these mountain communities alive and prospering. Summer visitors came to the Catskill Mountains for hunting, fishing, and hiking the peaks of Overlook Mountain, Big Indian, and Mount Tremper. There were so many fish in the streams near Woodstock that in one day in 1879, a local fisherman named Fred Happy caught almost 200 trout. Once the Ulster and Delaware Railroad was completed, day trippers could reach the Catskills in a few hours. Tourism flourished. As early as 1887, the Scientific American had recommended getting water for the city from west of the Hudson River. And so they realized that um, this was a place where there was um, catchment areas, uh, you know, valleys and so on that could easily be dammed, uh, a great deal of rainfall, you know, 40, 60 some odd inches a year. And, uh, and so the move was made to really take over this area by eminent domain. Residents of the Ashokan Valley hardly knew what was about to happen when city officials came calling in 1906, talking about damming the creek to build a reservoir for the city and requiring them to give up their homes. New York City was desperately in need of water. And the people just didn't understand. This was unreal to them to think that they would have to lose their homes and their property to give water to New York City. The city was going to use the power of eminent domain, or condemnation, to take their farms, homes, and property. Many were forced to sell out for what city officials considered fair market value. Some people were pleased with their settlement. The Ulster and Delaware Railroad was awarded $2,800,000 for its properties. A local sheriff named Boyce was given $28,000 for his sawmill. Not everyone was so lucky, and some believed they were given a raw deal. They dug in their heels, but were eventually forced to leave. A deep resentment and mistrust of the city remains to this day. When plans to build the Ashokan Reservoir were first announced, Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, The New York World, called it the Asopus Folly. Corruption was suspected when the city awarded the job to the MacArthur Brothers and Winston and Company, who had submitted the second highest bid of $12.6 million. Pulitzer called for an investigation and demanded that the water commissioners resign. The bid that MacArthur and Winston gave was about maybe 2.7 some odd million dollars to build the dam and the dikes. And the lowest bidder was uh, nearly $2 million less than that. It was a company named John Pierce. So there was a big furor. But subsequently, when the study was done and they looked into it, they found that um, John Pierce and company couldn't do it for the price that they had said they would, that it wouldn't have been possible to do that, and that they really didn't have uh, the expertise to do it. And so the decision which had originally been made to give the contract to MacArthur and Winston was a sound one. When the city decided that uh, the Catskills were the appropriate source and, and that it was feasible to them, you know, because they held hearings in 1906 in Kingston, and some of the, the more prominent individuals in, in Ulster County spoke out at the hearings. One, for example, was uh, 
a man by the name of Samuel Decker Kirkendall. Kirkendall was a big player in the late 19th, early 20th century in Ulster County. He, uh, he owned the, the railroad, the Ulster Delaware Railroad. He owned the quarries, uh, you know, great many things, uh, Grand Hotel, things of that sort. But he spoke out very strongly because he said, number one, uh, you know, we're going to have to move 11 miles of track and this is going to cost us a fortune and we don't want to do that. It's going to disrupt business and so on. And secondly, he said, uh, it will, in effect, destroy the boarding house business in, uh, you know, the Sopus Basin. And, 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 of course, he was correct. You know, all these people will be out of work and, uh, and there was a great deal of unemployment after the dam was finished. George Sterling, a lawyer for the city, argued that those driven off their land would be better off for it. If some of them are compelled to live in a little more cleanly manner than they have been accustomed to, he preached, they will have been taught a useful lesson in decency, cleanliness, and healthfulness. On May 4, 1906, the State Water Supply Commission approved the plan. This undertaking will destroy several small hamlets and a vast amount of valuable property, they wrote. But they added, the plans proposed are justified by public necessity. Now clearly the city of New York would be an entirely different thing than it is today if it didn't have the water and clearly it needed the water. The people who settled in this area, settled in this area back in colonial times to a large extent, the families are still here. And along comes this big upstart, the city of New York, which is 100 miles away and it has really no part and, and no interface with the folks up here and says, fine, you've got 30 days to get off your property. We're taking the property uh, and we're going to completely change it. In August of 1905, J. Waldo Smith, who had also supervised the new Croton and Muscoot reservoirs, started working on a huge engineering plan for damming the Esopus Creek, designing a dam tunnel connections, aerators, dikes, and stately water supply buildings. He was among a breed of inventors and engineers who brought major advances in technology to the world. When Henry Ford built his first Model T Ford, the Wright brothers flew the first airplane at Kitty Hawk, and huge ocean liners sailed around the world. By the time he was 15 years old, he was working on water projects in Massachusetts. Uh, he went to MIT, and by the time he was 17, he was the chief engineer of the actual water system in his hometown. Then he went on, as, as a relatively young person, to, uh, to engineer the creation of the new Croton Dam. And it was from there that he was hired to, uh, to do the job at Ashokan. He was paid about $15,000 a year, which doesn't sound like much, but it was quite a bit of money in those days. And uh, relatively speaking, he had absolute power over everything that was done. The, the clearing of the reservoir, the exhumation of the bodies, uh, the building of the dams, five and a half miles of dikes, you know, that sort of thing. And the tunnel, the uh, aqueduct that went 100 miles all the way to New York. I mean, he was in charge of the whole thing. Winston and Company was the principal contractor for the dam project, and they were headquartered at Brown's Station. Company Chief James O. Winston was a good-looking man with an imposing presence. Originally from Virginia, Winston had credentials as a dam builder and had built the Cross River Dam in 1905. His drive and ambition were without question, and he was a man of great brain power, as one of his sons said. Winston had a taste for excellence, fancy cars and fine cigars. A chauffeur drove him around the Ashokan site and he was a commanding presence as he inspected the work. Steam shovels, concrete mixers, stone crushers and railroad cars carrying bluestone from local quarries made the area hum with activity.
Much of the work was done by hand, and the Ashokan is often called the last of the handmade dams. Thousands of, of workers engaged on the project. During the height of the project, there were maybe 22, 2,500 people at work at one time. On the reservoir itself, you know, 350 mules, um, another 1,500 people working for the Board of Water Supply. Uh, it was a massive undertaking just in terms of personnel, obviously very costly, um, and it was all connected to the Catskill Aqueduct, too, which was going on at the same time. Well, the way that J. Waldo Smith, the chief engineer, decided in his designs to cross valleys and things was to burrow underneath rivers. And, uh, for example, this one goes underneath the, uh, the wall kill at New Paltz and, and the Rondad at High Falls, and then it, somewhere down by West Point, it, tunnels very deeply underneath the Hudson River. In uh, Roman times, you couldn't have a high pressure at all. You, with clay pipes and things like that, they, they would just break. Now with um, uh, steel reinforced concrete and, and with pure steel piping sometimes, uh, you can take care of those things. And I feel that the engineering and the design of this, uh, this aqueduct was, is really uh, a marvel of the world. To think that they could build um, a reservoir of that size, it's 12 miles long, a, a series of dams and weirs and, and tunnel, the delivery system, in, in 10 years or less is pretty remarkable given that they were working with mules and dynamite. Even though a great deal of manpower is used and, and people actually got out there and cut down trees and were grubbing out the roots and you know, digging up the, the graves and stuff like that, they did use um, what I suppose would be seen as the most advanced technology of the time. Uh, they had a big compressor station, you know, they used diamond drills, they used these large derricks, uh, you know, they certainly used railroads, steam engines, steam rollers, you know, things of that sort. So, uh, they were using what was available at the time. By 1913, the whole valley had changed. Homes were destroyed. Some people had the uh, money to move their homes. Uh, some did not. Um, they had to stand and watch them be burned to the ground, and even the ashes were removed. The valley floor was completely stripped. Trees were grubbed, the roots were grubbed out or blasted out, uh, even up onto the shoreline so that they would have a nice smooth beach all the way around. My mother showed more resentment than my grandmother. I don't remember my grandmother and grandfather saying anything really about it, but I'm sure they were heartbroken losing a 12-room home and a store and all. But my mother seemed to carry that resentment. She had fond memories as a child of that area, and they never really got over the hurt of losing their lands and their homes and their friends. I mean, people were dispersed. Uh, some left the area. Some committed suicide. They were so depressed. They took uh, some 10 towns. Some of them were like uh, West Hurley and Glenford and Ashton and uh, Brown Station and uh, Olive Bridge and Olive City and Broadheads Bridge and the Shokan and Boyceville. And some 10 villages disappeared. There was one fellow that I interviewed named Harlow McLean. And Harlow was long dead now, but he was a great big man, uh, you know, when he was young. And uh, he was hired by um, uh, Rice to act as a drover and use horses and oxen to pull things and, and also to burn down some of the old towns. And one of them was called Olive City, and that's where Harlow McLean was from. And he actually burned down his own house in his own town. kind of touching. I spoke to him, of course, many, many years after it, and he still had sort of like a tear in his eye.
Work on the reservoir happened incredibly fast. New railroad track and rails were put in place, running from Brown's Station to Olive Bridge, and an 89-foot-high trestle was built over the Esopus. Machine shops were built, stone crushing was done in huge pits, and Portland cement arrived by the train load. Blue stone was stacked, ready to be put into place. Heavy machinery was delivered. Italian stone cutters arrived by the hundreds. A 225 building camp, big enough to hold 4,000 workers, some with families, was built where the hamlet of Brown Station had stood. It was bigger than any of the local villages nearby and quite modern for the time. In its day, it was thought of as the uh, showplace of the Catskills. It, it probably had anywhere from three to 4,000 people living there at any one time. Uh, it had separate camps for different groups because they you know, didn't get along really that much. Wonderful stories about people living there, you know, people from other countries shooting owls and eating them and then being asked whether they liked it and saying they thought it was a chicken and, you know, that, uh, <laughs> that it was a little tough and uh, um, Italians making spaghetti and drying it on the lines and uh, it was a very colorful place. Uh, uh, locals from the farms used to love to go into the camp. Approximately 65% of the pay of unskilled workers went back to the company for food and lodging. Some of the wages were paid in scrip that were only good at the company store, which charged more than local stores did for butter, milk, and eggs. One day in 1909, an outside merchant, Samuel Silverstein, tried to deliver meat to the camp. Stopped at the gate and not allowed to sell his goods, Silverstein protested by blocking the entrance with his wagon and 12 carts. Although his meat spoiled during the day-long standoff, Silverstein refused to budge. The protest worked, and local courts opened the camp to outside peddlers. Muckers, people who just sort of dug, pick and shovel work, that sort of thing. Uh, they made about $1.20, and up to more uh, experienced people, more technically oriented, made about $1.60 for an eight-hour day. There was a short strike in 1908, and the radical industrial workers of the world came in to try, without success, to get a raise for laborers and protect them from dangerous working conditions. Injuries and fatalities on the job were common, as were illnesses from contagious diseases. The sound of mandolins, accordions, and guitars could be heard in the Italian camp known as Little Italy, Although many unskilled workers had arrived from southern Italy and Sicily, skilled and artistic Italian stonecutters did much of the highly regarded bluestone work along the reservoir. Italian Americans were the largest segment of the Ashokan workforce, more than half of all the workers. By 1908, there were 123 African Americans working on the project. Many were expert mule drivers who had worked successfully on public works projects in the South and at the Croton Dam. Black workers were segregated and forced to live in separate quarters away from the white camps. Overt racism was common in the early 1900s and for the most part taken for granted by white workers and foremen who worked the Ashokan. Despite these hardships, African Americans were essential to the success of the project and they handled mules and heavily loaded wagons with great skill. The labor camp's bakery turned out 5,000 loaves of bread each day. Shoemakers, barbers, blacksmiths, doctors, and nurses worked hard to meet the needs of the workers. 
The Board of Water Supply Police Force at the Ashokan Camp had at one point more than 350 patrolmen who made hundreds of arrests for burglary, drunkenness, armed robbery, assault, and even murder. By the time the project was over, some 500 convictions had been upheld. A substantial amount of, of that would be the result of uh, fighting, murders, knife fights, uh, one, one story, a, a Polish fellow and uh, I think Italian fellow were playing cards and something happened, uh, maybe someone cheated and he took his hatchet and cut the guy's head in two. In general, however, the Ashokan camp was relatively peaceful and well-organized, although the work was dangerous. I tell the story of a young man named Kist, who was from this area, who got married over the weekend and started his job on the reservoir on a Monday, and that very same day he fell into one of these great big crushers, you know, that would break up the rock and they'd mix it with the cement and, and that sort of thing. People were not infrequently scalded, you know, by, by steam. Uh, they had steam compressors, you know, that they would use. Uh, people fell off the dam, you know, off scaffolding, things of that sort. Uh, it was not uncommon for people to fall out of machinery and be run over by it or run over by the mules or something of that sort. The most grisly job of the project was the removal of human remains from local cemeteries. 2,720 bodies were moved from the reservoir region which one enraged farmer called body snatching. One of the workers exhuming bodies called it one of the most gruesomest, interesting jobs he'd ever worked on. There were 40 cemeteries in the reservoir area, some of which were quite old. The moving of bodies was a sore point among local residents who feared that their ancestors would be lost entirely or wrongfully identified. By 1909, Work at the construction site was at its peak. The big dam would eventually be built to a height of 252 feet. Seven million cubic yards of earth would support the structure. An enormous amount of Portland cement used in conjunction with bluestone was used in the main dam. There was so much used, it could have buried Kingston's historic stockade neighborhood in 2,000 feet of concrete. The dam itself would be a thousand feet long, 190 feet wide, and 23 feet wide at the top. In 1909, there was a sense that the success of the project was assured. A year later, attitudes suddenly changed. Torrential downpours in the spring of 1910 caused flooding that tore the Bishop's Falls Bridge off its foundation and sent it crashing into the dam. The next year brought drought. Some wondered if the Esopus Creek would really be a reliable source of water. After seven years of constant work and construction, water dribbled into the completed West Basin on September 9, 1913. There had been little rain that summer. Local farmers joked the city might as well buy some water from Sears and Roebuck. In September, a big rainstorm dumped four inches of rain in the mountains. The basin filled up to 1,200 million gallons quickly. Throughout the fall, huge storms pounded the Catskills. On November 8th, almost seven inches of rain soaked the mountains that surround West Shokan, turning the Ashokan Reservoir into what one person called a raging sea. On June 14th, 1914, Winston and company whistles echoed through the valley for an hour. The work was finished. 55 billion gallons filled both basins to almost half their full capacity. By December of 1916, the finishing touches were complete, including the world's biggest aerator. Workers streamed out of the Ashokan Valley. The camp began to look like a ghost town. Soon the time will come when we'll part Somewhere else we'll make a fresh start There's regret in every man's heart When we leave the reservoir
A celebration in Central Park took place when Ashokan water was unleashed into a distributing reservoir as City Mayor Peroy Mitchell simply turned a valve. The water came to New York City without pumps. It flowed from the Catskills by gravity alone. It had been less than 20 years since the Catskills were targeted. The plan for delivering the good gift of water to the city had become a reality. As work on the Ashokan was winding down, plans were already being put in place to create a backup water supply. In 1915, the Board of Water Supply looked north to tap a second source in case of prolonged drought in the Asopus Valley. They moved to dam the Schoharie Creek at the hamlet of Gilboa. The plan was controversial. Wasn't the Ashokan enough? Did the city have enough money for another expensive water project? Despite these concerns, the project started on July 19, 1919. A poem by V. D. Matthijs summed up local anger about the project. Many damage claims are pending. Some are large and some are small. There should be a stipulation, a square deal for one and all. It's a case of sheer compulsion, taking what another owns. Surely it's no trifling matter, forcing people from their homes. Like the Ashokan, the Gilboa Dam, Schoharie Reservoir, and Shandakan Tunnel were built by thousands of workers, many of them immigrants. They lived in labor camps during the eight years it took to clear the valley of buildings, graves, and vegetation to build the dam. Most impressively, they took the Schoharie Creek, which normally runs north, and rerouted it to flow south. The plan was to send the water through an 18-mile tunnel at Shandakan and wind up in the Asopus Creek and the Ashokan Reservoir. The tunnel was the longest in the world at the time, a marvel of ingenuity and technology. Workers burrowed and blasted through solid rock, dangerous inch by inch, in summer and winter, under the harshest working conditions. One day in 1921, workers at a quarry for the Gilboa Dam made an astounding discovery. They uncovered some of the oldest tree ferns and stumps ever found, ancient fossils from a forest that was 350 million years old. Ironically, these rare fossils put Gilboa on the map, even as the reservoir flooded and wiped away the hamlet. In 1925, a fire destroyed 18 buildings and forced residents who had been holding out to leave town. It was said to be caused by burning rubbish, although some people had their doubts. Before year's end, Bureau of Water Supply employees burned the rest of the buildings in town. The Schoharie Reservoir displaced 500 people in Gilboa on outlying farms and at properties along the Schoharie Creek. The Schoharie was completed in 1926. In November of that year, a huge storm unleashed 11 billion gallons into the basin. Gilboa was no more. Yeah, there's water in the dam that will quench old New York's thirst. From Browns to Kensico is the road we travels first. There's the chambers, tunnels, siphons, and all filling each up from wall to wall. Dare we did, dare we can.
For yet's Kahari calls us and round up bids us come. Conservation is the word that we love like the cuckoo bird. There we did, there we can fall the water in the dam. Yeah, man. There we did, there we can fall the water in the dam. After the completion of the Catskill system, the city looked further west for more water and built the Delaware water system. In the 1950s, the Rondout, the Neversink, and the Papacton were completed. The Cannonsville Reservoir was added to the system in 1965. The Delaware system and aqueduct required the flooding of 16 additional villages. When the Ashokan Reservoir is filled to capacity, it holds 123 billion gallons. The Schoharie holds 17.6 billion gallons. Altogether, 40% of the city's daily water needs are provided by the Catskill system. Almost 90 years have passed since the Ashokan Reservoir delivered fresh Catskill Mountain water to New York City, as well as to several counties north of the city. Residents of the five boroughs of New York consume over one billion gallons of water each day. Incredibly, the system has never failed. Gravity continues to carry unfiltered water to the city through tunnels and pipes that run under rock beneath the Hudson River and eventually into apartments and high-rise office buildings throughout the city. The 1997 New York City Watershed Memorandum of Agreement is an attempt by the city and upstate communities to keep water sources pure. By keeping the Catskill Mountain environment clean, and restricting private homeowners and businesses from polluting the region, the city hopes to avoid building a hugely expensive filtration plant. The latest plan is controversial, as was the original building of the water system. Some still see the DEP as an occupying force, and old resentments and linger. Happens, you guys come in and tell them you have to do this, this, that, and that. They cannot afford it. And they don't get to ask any questions, they're told. The bottom line is we have told the folks up here that we understand that we have a partnership, that that partnership requires that we both work together. And what I've asked them to do is please don't look back, look forward, understand that the city of New York recognizes that it's in the city's best interest that the folks who live up here and work up here survive because if they don't, the alternative is probably going to be a bigger problem for my water system than the folks that are up here now. Many residents speculate that without the reservoir, there would be massive development in the Asopus Valley. The village of West Shokan would be bigger than Woodstock. It'd be one constant neon sign after another from uh, Kingston to Venetia. And so when you go down there and you look at all that water or stand on the dam, I think it's a hell of a lot nicer than looking at neon signs. The only thing is, the city could do a whole lot more than being a better neighbor. So there has always been this love-hate relationship between New York and uh, the country upstate. Uh, you know, the, the upstaters, I think, recognize their, their, their connection to the city um, economically and, and otherwise. But um, there's always been this bitterness that the city just basically came here and took what it needed. And I think there are millions of people in New York City who haven't a clue where the water comes from when they turn on the tap and what kind of sacrifices were made on their behalf. And um, it's, I, I think it's, it's time that they knew and appreciated that. In parts of the United States, Water supplies have been compromised by groundwater pollution, overuse, and changing weather patterns. Clean water, our most precious resource, may be running out. New York City and the Catskills are now and forever linked by water, the lifeblood of the world's greatest city. In the Catskills, water continues to flow as freely as it did 100 years ago. Today, lying beneath the tranquil waters of the Ashokan and the Schoharie. The ghosts of an earlier time 
continue to build our future. Beautiful dam, that great big beautiful dam, finest in the universe, and that's no myth. The man who built it is J. Waldo Smith. Dam, 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 oh that beautiful dam. <laughs> 